नमस्कार एंड गुड मॉर्निंग आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस दिसन वेर आई लाइक टू टॉक अबाउट पुअरली अंडरस्टूड ग्रुप ऑफ कॉमन डायवर्सिटी इन इंडिया एंड दिस ग्रुप इज ट्रिमेंडस इन मेनी वेज बट वी नो वेरी लिटल अबाउट दैट so to go further and to understand this group i thought of no uh, looking at it in a different perspective in a perspective of a researcher who studying this group for the last 20 years and trying to put forth my view you no know, pertaining to this group you no know, and uh, this is one of my efforts to talk about and then to get as well here thank you very much kerkar uh, college for this wonderful opportunity and Uh, especially Nagesh uh, Dattadar for uh, giving me this chance to interact with such a large uh, intellectual group. No. Okay, let's talk uh, about India and the biodiversity of India. So, if we think of India, India is well known for many things, but one of the crucial, vital, important thing for India is unity and diversity. Think of India. India is not one unit. When it comes to biodiversity, one of the biodiversity-rich countries in the world. Look at the landmass; it is one of the smallest landmass, but it has so many things. You know? Okay, so let's see you know, how it started. We all know that entire globe was one, but entire world was one unit at one point of time, and then it started you know, separating from there. India was part of Africa. India was there with Africa at one point of time, and then the journey started from there. You know, and that journey. and the events associated with that has you no know, tremendous uh, impact on the diversity of india as such you know so something around 150 to 160 million years ago this is what the journey started and uh, you know this plate which started drifting from africa and attached to asian plate by around uh, 45 to 55 million years ago you no know, this entire journey and the events which happened there shaped what india is. now interestingly this is what is very crucial very interesting fact about this landscape the landscape has everything you know? so so that made me fascinated about understanding what is there and one of the groups which was not poorly which was not very properly studied and that was that against the reference i concentrated my efforts on that particular thing so again i am not i am not an expert to talk about this group but i feel that you know I understood and this trying to put them here. Okay, so let's see. You no, know, this is what this was the situation at one point of time, and uh, you no, know, this is something Gondwana land, and we started from there. You no, know, this is around two hundred million years ago. You know. So basically, something around hundred sixty million years ago, sixty six million years ago, this was the condition. Like right? we we started drifting from Madagascar. So. so we we can confidently tell these things because nowadays people are looking at a dna and they try to understand the you no know, they they utilize the dna to understand the biodiversity you no know? and many many species which has affinity uh, towards like there are many species in india which has affinity affinity towards african elephants you no know, there are many species in africa and india they they have similar ancestors and so on so so this tells us you no know, what India is when it started. Who are our you know, closest relatives and so and so forth. Interestingly, I'm just trying to show you some of the important events which shape what India is today. If you look at this now, this is this is something very very interesting. This is the landmass which we which started drifting. This particular entire landmass was wet ever wet evergreen forest. Imagine this is something really very interesting. So when India started drifting from Africa, this entire landmass was wet evergreen forest. and uh, you know this is another very very important event in the history of india in the biogeographic history of india you know by around 65 million years ago when india was still drifting there was a deccan trap volcanic event deccan trap volcanism and that event has did quite a lot of impact on the the entire aspect of that you no know, and we are just trying to look at biodiversity here 
but look at look at this i think roughly half of the india was kind of kind of gone at that particular point of time and this event was happening maybe 3 to 4 million years or 40 to 4 million years which really must have finished any floral or faunal diversity known from that particular place this is imagine like this is what was happened another interesting thing is india yeah, again cross this equator line as well no then there are various hypotheses like about the faunal diversity no if you look at floral or faunal diversity in india so if you go towards northeastern part of india you will get uh, no elements coming from like you will mostly get the indo chinese elements in the western ghats we have quite a lot of endemic elements and there are many species which has affinities with africa no if you go towards gujarat and rajasthan that part no? you will get some middle east elements or european elements coming in from that so let's see how does this you know, happen so there are various hypotheses people talk about it and this is something very interesting so one of the hypotheses which says that india when india was drifting it drifted very close to sunda islands and all those things so this one of the major species exchange happened was here and one of the another hypothesis which says that india was drifting close to africa so exchange is happening from here so still debates are happening still go things are happening but this is what is something make me you know happy that it has been all these things you know this is something very very interesting then at one point of time so this was the age when india got attacked by africa so what happened at that particular point of time himalaya himalayas formed you know and then quite a lot of many events happened aridification event happened and so and so forth and that led to what india is today okay so the entire wet evergreen forest at one point of time got converted into 10 biogeographic zones this is something very very unique for the planet you know it was wet evergreen forest and today there are 10 biogeographic zones all these biogeographic zones has their own elements come to western ghats there are quite a lot of it's a rich diversity there and rich endemicity as well there are so many species that are endemic to this particular landscape but just go towards you no know, peninsula and then you will realize that you no know, there is something else that particular landscape has something else you no know, and so and so I'm not going to all these details but every place has its you own unique diversity so that's make india a very very unique landscape okay interestingly this is just a overview of uh, what faunal diversity we have you know? if you look at this is one of the documents i got from that is a website and uh, I, i think the number must be more now but just look at this if you look at the vertebrate diversity fishes are dominating then we have birds then we have mammals and amphibians and reptiles also have a lot of part to play no and when it comes to the problems the animals these these animals facing i think amphibians are leading in that and then we have reptiles and so on so on so i'm just trying to know talk about a very interesting group here that is about uh, you know amphibians and reptiles so just let's talk about them let's discuss about them no so they are generally called as herpetofauna herpetofauna is the group of uh, amphibians and reptiles and herpetology is the study which deals with studying amphibians interestingly this is one of the neglected vertebrate group okay when i say neglected it it, it, it implies to the fact that there are very few people who can get uh, and studying amphibians and reptiles in india uh, and this is the fact so look at amount of people who are studying birds amount of people who are studying mammals amount of people who are studying fishes i think in amphibians and reptiles there are very few people who are contributing to understanding this group no and all the vertebrate groups are separate but i don't know why amphibians and reptiles are put together these are the two distinct group but again we consider them as one unit uh and that also has a tremendous diversity but very few elements are there okay hence i am calling this as a neglected group another reason for calling this as a neglected group is we don't know many things about them i am going to talk about that in the next course interestingly no they are widely visible and let's talk about that as well but again they are neglected group so how do they help us you know just see what how amphibians and reptiles are helping us 
and say that if the amphibians and reptiles are not there, humans will not survive. Very, 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 very you know, crucial point I'm bringing in here. You know? See, they are at a very crucial juncture. Any food chain, I think you all are the teachers, you all are people who are associated with nature, we know the food chain. Tell me one food chain where amphibians and reptiles are not mentioned. We teach, whenever we teach food chain, we mention about frog, we mention about snake, because they are the crucial components of food chain. Okay, so how do they help us? Frogs mostly feed on insects. They control the population of insects. They are predators. They are the food for aerovertebrates as well. This is something really, very important. Okay, and they have many roles to play. I'm not going to those details. So let's see Herbert von Oppenheimer. No, at one point of time, India was called as country of snakes and snake charmers. That was how India was protected by many people in the past, and maybe that was a fact. But really, is this the country of snake and snake charmers? If you ask the same people today, I, I think they will not be alive. But people from those countries today, I think they they will have a different perspective now. They will have a different the study of India. Few people are contributing to understand the diversity of reptiles in India and they are publishing their work and that has changed the perception of uh, you know, Indian herpetology and people studying herpetology today. Interestingly, these are the animals which are hated for no obvious reason. I always say that, no, I don't feel that there are people who like amphibians and reptiles. No, they don't have a neutral value as well, but they hate them. No, I will give you an interesting example. For example, earthworms are there. No, we don't like earthworms and we don't hate them. They have a neutral value. But this is not the scene with amphibians and reptiles. No, people hate lizards, people hate snakes, people hate frogs. And there are reasons, obvious reasons, uh, for hating them, but those are not the real. Okay. So let's see what we know about amphibians and reptiles from India. So this is the figure I got today. There are something around 420 species of amphibians and around 675 species of reptiles. But believe me, this is not a fact. There are many new species getting added. Before two days, there is there is there is one new species of snake described. So this tells us that you no, know, there is this number is going to get increased in the future. Okay, but this is what is the picture today. Second thing, the diversity of amphibians and reptiles in India is highly concentrated in the Persian Ghats and northeastern part of India. There are quite a few species which are there in islands as well. And this is the place where much of the diversity of amphibians and reptiles is concentrated. But that doesn't mean that they are not there in northern landscapes as well. They are there, but they are not in large numbers. That's what I mean to say. Second thing, which is really, really makes ecology and habitat of India for unique because more than 50% of amphibians and around 50% of reptiles are endemic to the landscape. Only known from what the geographical boundary we call as India. They are only known from this place. Just imagine like 50% diversity is endemic, which makes us responsible. Have to be more responsible towards them because they are the Indian element. Okay. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, there are many new species getting added. Okay. So these are the people who shaped our understanding, who enriched our understanding of the amphibians and reptiles in India. So most of these are Europeans and they are not alive today. But whatever we know. About amphibians and reptiles today, the credit goes to these people. No, I'm giving 1758 as a landmark because that is the time when Carl Linnaeus started uh, binomial nomenclature, started describing species. And then many people added, you know, described quite a lot of new species after that. One of the prominent Indian figures was C.N.R. Rao, who studied the frog and he described quite a lot of new species of frogs uh, during this period. Okay. The primitive, this particular era was mostly dominated by uh, new species descriptions. So much of the documentation happened during this period. 
the, the only prominent work happened was quite a lot of species that I had during this time. Interestingly, many of these new species descriptions are very short and they have very vague description. You know? Like they just the entire description is based in one paragraph. Many species are described based on coloration, and uh, I'm coming to that. But you know, that was the time when people used uh, descriptions in this way. Very short descriptions, very little bit information. But now there are people going ahead and describing. Many times the locality data was quite interesting. Okay, I'm talking about endemic diversity. This is an endemic, very small landscape, very small places. There are few species only known from two localities. Huh? And when you say that the species is known from Western part, where in Western part? Which part of the Western part? Which state of the Western part? At what altitude? All these things really matter today because with the high scale understanding of our diversity we realize that you know, all these things matter for the understanding of environment. When you say that this particular space is known from India, I think big confusion. Another thing is Malabar. What is Malabar? You know, which part of the Malabar? That's what I mean to say. Interestingly, much of these descriptions are done by non-professionals. No? Non-professionals, many of these people were passionate herpetologists. I will not say that they are not the expert, they are the best people in their work, but they are not the professional. Why I am telling this? Because the understanding of market of is enriched by natural. The take home message here is if you want to contribute towards this field, you can. You don't have to worry about what your profession is, but if you want, you can contribute. So that's what I mean to say. Another thing, many of these new species descriptions are based on painting. Earlier days, people used to do paintings, so nice paintings, very detailed paintings, with proper taxonomic information attached with those paintings. And people described uh, species based on those paintings. So the best example is, you know, this uh, bronze back tree snake, Dendrolapis tristus, that is described based on painting. And Talked about okay, and now who are the people who are contributing towards enriching the Harvard fauna diversity in India after 1947? No? So there are many people there. I'm just showing you some of the representative people. Okay, this doesn't this is not a complete picture. There are many people who are you know, doing this work. So this is Dr. S. K. Datta, this is Ashok Captain, Aaron Bauer, David Bauer, Mark Wilkinson, Indranil Das. Dr. S. D. Biju, Dr. Raju Vyas. These are some of the few representative people I'm mentioning here. And they really worked meticulously towards documentation of ambivalent and reptiles in India. Another thing some of these people did was they encouraged the new generation to do science, to do concrete science, to talk of science uh, of uh, pertaining to ambivalent and reptiles. So they and many of the researchers are collaborating with these people and describing or understanding the diversity. This is something really, very, very interesting. Okay. So this particular era was also dominated by anecdotal uh, uh, descriptions. Why is why I'm saying anecdotal? Because you know, there was no dedicated reference. People got certain things, they described the, those based on very preliminary things. So I went to some place, I got a lizard, I thought this is a new species and I described it is like that. Okay. But there, yeah. Unfortunately, there were quite a few bad descriptions as well. See, again, why I'm bringing this point here because when you do wrong science, science is a universal commodity today. You do something wrong, it goes through the people. People read it and if it is wrong, they don't blame the person, they blame the country. So I'm just trying to bring a very crucial aspect here because there are when, when new people are getting added, you know, we tend to publish certain things. You know? So if you're publishing something bad, that creates wrong impact for the country. So don't do that. And then there are some amazing descriptions out there. You know? So I think as I told you, in the beginning, people used to describe the species one paragraph, but in this particular time, I've seen certain papers where the papers were 
know, five to seven pages long. So that itself tells us how the things metamorphose. And uh, these are this is the young brigade. Again, this is not a complete picture. There are many people who are contributing towards it, but these are some of the few people who are really contributing towards understanding of the harbor of diversity in India. And they are doing this for more than 15 to 20 years now. Really, really important. So I am called. I call this as a young brigade because these are the people who are dedicated to looking at the diversity and documenting, doing something associated with that for the last 20 years. So this is something very, very important for us. And all these are amazing people. They are doing tremendous work, and they brought the huge change. They brought the bio, uh, diversity of India to the forefront now. Much of these people are globally recognized. Okay. This particular era has a robust new specific features. Why? What I mean robust is they are looking at new species descriptions to finer details. They are trying to look at multiple characters describing them in greater details. That's what I mean with robust new species description. Okay. Interestingly, this is the time when we look Sampling. So this is sampling they are visiting many places, trying to go there, trying to understand. Like for example, Dr. Ishan Agarwal. You know, he traveled across India when he was doing his PhD. And uh, he was just looking at three group of uh, lizards, geckos basically. And he traveled across India to do that. That is one of the reasons that he became a scientist. You know? So there are many, many people who are contributing towards uh, certain, uh, certain groups of animals and reptiles in India. In this way now. So very detailed work, very thorough work, very intense work which is happening, which makes you know, which is enriching the uh, uh of understanding today. This is the time when phylogeny and biogeography also started. This is a lab, uh Dr. Pravin Karan's lab is one of the prominent contributors towards the you know, there are many PhD students and Pravin himself as contributors to our understanding of uh, many groups of uh, amphibians and reptiles, not amphibians but mostly reptiles, about the phylogeny and biogeography. Dr. S. D. Biju's group is contributing to you know, uh, amphibians again. So I think this this is the time when we have crossed that barrier of new species description, anecdotal new species description. We are going ahead and doing quite a lot of things now. And uh, as I, I think it's quite a few people we saw. What are the challenges and opportunities in Indian herpetology? Now, how many species? We don't know. Okay. Why we don't know? I'll tell you. There are many species which identification is purely based on visual cues. We just look at some dots and dots. Until today, many people are doing that. Please don't do it. So look at the characters. There is, a, there is quite a lot of things which you can do. And then there are many places where work is not being done. We have to do that. So how many species? We don't know. So what are the opportunities? Let's talk about that. Let's add towards the knowledge of amphibians and reptiles in that way. Second thing, what do we know about the habit, habitats, and the status? So, except a few, hardly five to ten species, we don't know anything about many species of amphibians and reptiles in India. So don't you feel that this is the opportunity? Now, starting from their habits and habitats, and how do they breed? What do they eat? Where do they live? Load, load so many questions which we don't know. And I think we have to you know, add towards this understanding in many ways. And now I think you are the people from different landscapes in India. Just imagine like everybody is going to select one or two groups or one or two, one or two species and ask questions pertaining to them breeding behavior, pertaining to their breeding behavior, pertaining to their habitat preference. Just imagine how much data, how much knowledge we can contribute towards these fields. This is something really, really important. Third is what are the dedicated conservation efforts? Except a few groups, I think we are not concentrating on, you know, uh, we are not looking at amphibians and reptiles in conservation perspective. Yet. Imagine if you are conserving amphibians and reptiles, what you are going to conserve? You are conserving various landscapes, you are conserving forests, you are conserving grasslands, you are conserving water bodies, you are conserving everything, you are conserving everything, and you are conserving the landscape where tiger lives. 
and considering the tiger that so this is one of my philosophies towards that okay see what are the contributions you can make towards phylogeny systematics biogeography and all those things i'm just trying to put forth certain thoughts here first thing what are the potent tools one is decoding the cryptic diversity what is cryptic diversity there is quite a lot of species which look similar but they are something else they are different so we are trying to understand that and uh, we can do that we have to follow integrated approach what is integrated approach integrated approach is to phylogeny dna and taxonomy bring them together do it seriously look at multiple lines of evidence and come up with your uh, paper come up with come, come up with your findings so that's what i mean integrated approach it's a very important thing now don't look at one thing and say that this is what it is look at everything put everything together how you can do that you can collaborate with people no this is something which is needed today second thing we know that there are many species that are widely distributed no uh, common garden lizard or common uh, indian toad these are the two best examples we are calling them as widely distributed now my question is are they really widely distributed believe me they are not there are many species in that particular complex needs your attention which need to be described i think this is the time we have to step ahead and look at all the so called widely distributed species try to understand are they really widely distributed or there is something wrong third is quite a lot of species are not known to science yet so we have to do that we have to document this and help you understand and there are many biogeographic zones as i told you in the beginning western ghats and north northeastern part of india is explored what about the other landscapes what about the other biogeographic zones those are not been explored until now so this is the time we have to step ahead and do the exploration in these places as well okay so let's see what do we mean by decoding the cryptic diversity i'm just trying to give you some of the examples have been published this is a work by dr ishan agarwal and he looked at one group of lizards called cirtopodium no so this is a genus of a lizard called cirtopodium is a uh, it came into india from middle east and uh, no it's distributed in this particular place the distribution of this particular genus is here no? so what ishan did ishan tried to look at you no know, visited all these places you know, did sampling across and now when he looked at this particular thing he realized that oh it's not two or three species there are multiple species here and when we looked at the taxonomy when we looked at the morphology character there is nothing wrong they all are distinct genetically but morphologically they look same that's why, that's what i mean to say cryptic diversity so this is one representative example there are many many groups like that in india we have to decode all this cryptic diversity Second thing, why they distributed or not? This is another paper published by Aparna Lazmi, and 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 I was one of the authors in their paper. And what we did here, there is a species called Hemilactus lupulus. Okay, that species is known from at one point of time it is known from uh, Asia and Africa. And over a period of time, the species which were considered as Bruki from Africa they got a different name. There are many species from India. they are also something else now there is a work by the nice paper by shivan mahoni who said that now all the synonyms in that particular complex are valid and we tried to you know use the dna to understand that and it was it was real so this bruki hemitaclus bruki the species which is not there in india was considered as one there are there are, i think what i mean to say there are eight to 10 species here and they all were considered as hemitaclus bruki and interestingly hemitaclus bruki is not in india it is somewhere else it is in india no so this is what i mean to say when you say it is widely distributed we treat them we take them for granted we don't get them so i, I feel that we should come out of that you no know, under uh, philosophy and start you no know, seriously looking at these things second thing unknown diversity there are many groups like sicilians 
for that matter. No? We don't know much about them. But there are many groups. I think in amphibians, in frogs especially, there are many lizards where diversity is not known. Let's go and try to document it. And what I mean to another very important thing is unexplored landscape. So this is a paper again led by Isha Madhubal where he described uh, three, I think, three new species of uh, And this is from a landscape which is outside the Western Ghats or outside the North Eastern part of India. And still, there is tremendous diversity in other biogeographic zones as well. And we have to document that. So, we have to document arid landscapes, semi-arid landscapes, trans-Himalayas, Himalayas, so gangetic plains. Everywhere we have to go and try to document the diversity of amphibians and now, this is what is the opportunity. Okay, what about ecology and natural history? Are we really looking at the, this aspect of absence of reference as well? I, my question is no. No, as I told you, there's more than 1,000 species of amphibians and reptiles are there. Around, something around 420 species of amphibians. And what we know about them? We know very little about two or three things. Means there are more than 400 species for which no data is I don't think that this is a tremendous opportunity for us. Let's go ahead and do that as well. So this is one of the papers where uh, Kai Thunde, Nikki Kai Thunde and me published a note on breeding in Europe, one of the endemic genera called in the Indirana. Okay, so this species is Indirana Chiravati from Amboli, where we saw its breeding behavior at public amphibians. So it's a very unique breeding strategy for them. And probably many species in India are following this kind of very interesting strategies which we need to explore. Like, look at this now. This is a Malabar pit viper and look at the polymorphism. They all are one species but look at the coloration. The tremendous polymorphism is there. Why do they have this? This is one representative example. There are many, many groups like that in India for which we don't have the answer. No? Why certain snakes behave like this, we don't know. Why certain frogs behave like that, we don't know. How oh, the diversification events happened. Why a lizard behave like that, we don't know. So all these questions are quite uh, interesting. And we have tremendous potential, uh, humongous potential to understand. Uh, all these things. Okay, another very, very crucial fact is that. Uh, so why people do like amphibians and reptiles is, is because of the language. Okay, we have to generate real awareness among people so that we will get more data to you know, document. Do all the work which I mentioned before. No? I think I tried my level best to do the justice for the the picture of Indian herpetology and to put forth certain views where what we can do. So before I conclude, I would like to say that this is the golden era for Indian herpetology. No? As I told you, we started with taxonomy at one point of time and today. There are people who are contributing to various groups now, various aspects of herpetology. There is, there is the ecological study happening, there is you know, the natural history studies are happening, there is tremendous taxonomic work is happening, there is biogeography related work is happening, phylogeny work is happening. Means the platform is ready. No? And we have to use this platform to do something productive. No? Collaborate. People and you know, do some interesting work. For this, I feel that we have to have a dedicated and dedicated approach. It should be our priority. Now. We have to be very dedicated towards documenting this diversity or understanding this diversity, and we have to follow the integrated approach. Third is awareness is something we still need people. We still need more people uh, to uh, enriching the knowledge. Okay, let's mesmerize by them. Okay, I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity, especially Dr. Nagesh Dabdada. Sorry, sir, it got delayed from my side, but today I am, sent, uh, I am sending this presentation to you for this opportunity. And thank you very much for this. Okay, and uh, this is my email ID. If you want, uh, no, you can get in touch with me on this particular email ID. Available. Please send me an email if you need anything about this particular program because of reptiles. And uh, this was so, and this is what is my number. These are what my number is. No, please, no, let's give each other on this particular thing. Thank you very much.